In this video, we'll look at the evolution and growth of types. The types can be anything. It can be genotypes in a population or molecules in a test tube. At first, let's look at the growth of a single type. So X represents how many of this type we have, how many molecules, what's the concentration or anything. W is the growth rate of this type. And if we go from one time step to the next, X prime is the, uh, the concentration of the number of molecules the next time step. If we want to look t time steps into the future, xt, we simply take w to the power of t, so xt is equal to w to the power of t times x0. Let's look what happens when we do that. So I'm taking w to be 1.1, and I start with x0 equal 1. We see the growth of this, this single type. This type increases from 1 to uh, 10 and further. And now let's see what happens when we have a growth rate lower than 1. So let's take a growth rate of 0 0.9. Everything else is the same. Now we see that the type, of course, decreases in frequency. It starts at 1 and then exponentially decreases towards 0. This decrease below 1 is called the extinction threshold. When a type, when a molecule, is below the extinction threshold, it simply will disappear. Most molecules that we have around us have this property and uh, only molecules that really replicate themselves with high fidelity can go above this extinction threshold. The extinction threshold is separate from the error catastrophe. The error catastrophe is what we'll talk about here. The error catastrophe doesn't happen when a type goes extinct, but instead when it cannot be maintained versus other types. We can represent more than one type as a vector in the population. So let's look at two types. X is now a vector. We have one of type 1, one of type 2. And when X is a vector, we, go, we can simply represent the growth as a diagonal matrix. W is the growth matrix. And here I'm taking 1.1 and 0 0.95. We go from one time step to the next simply by taking X prime equal to W, the matrix, times X, matrix multiplication. If we multiply W times X, you see we get 1.1 and 0.95. So type 1 grew by 10%, type 2 decreased by 5%. If we want to apply W twice, we apply W times W times X0. And you see that we put W on the left. So we add more and more Ws on the left. And this is because I chose to take X to be a column vector. If I had taken X as a row vector, I could have put X on the left, and then we would have added Ws on the right. We can take a look at x at time t by simply taking the matrix power of w to the power of t times x0. Let's do that. So we start again with 1, 1. We take the w matrix that we had before. And here you see the growth of the two types. Type 1 really increases exponentially in frequency. Type 2 decreases because its growth rate is lower than 1 and goes to 0. So type 1 took over the population. You might think that now this describes any population. If we add mutation, then we would ha just have type 1 as the wild type, as the type that is present. And all other types just are represented as uh, small mutants. It turns out that this is not exactly a right description of uh, a species in most cases. So in, mo in most cases, a species will not simply be represented by one type that is the optimal and all other types that appear at uh, really low rates. Let's plot this plot that we had here in log as a log plot. Now we can see that type 1 increases exponentially, which in a log plot uh, is a straight line, and type 2 decreases exponentially. Let's add mutations. So now I add a mutation rate of uh, 10%, and the mutation, mutations are simply represented by stochastic matrix M, uh, where in this case type 1 maintains itself with a, a probability of 1 minus mu and turns to type 2 with a probability mu. Type 2 doesn't mutate. It stays uh, as type 2 and doesn't mutate to type 1 at first. So we take this m. We start again from the same x0 as we had before. And now let's see what happens when we mutate. So since type 1 mutates to type 2, now you see there is less of type 1 and more of type 2. Now we want to represent the dynamics with both mutation and growth. We can simply do this by multiplying the matrices, W times M. 
It's also possible to multiply m times w in, in a different order, and this simply says which is done first, gross or mutation. And since, since gross follows mutation, follows gross follows mutation, it doesn't really matter which order you do it. I simply chose w times m because the algebra is easier. If we take the w times m, the matrix, and diagonalize it, it's easier to look at the uh, matrix power. So if w times m is equal to v times d times v minus 1, where d is a diagonal matrix, and v is the eigenvector matrix of all the eigenvectors of the, of the matrix w times m, it's easy to calculate w times m to the power of t because it's simply v times d to the t times v to the minus 1. d to the t is dominated by the largest eigenvalue, just like we saw before, that type 1 grew with a higher rate than all the other types, than type 2. When d is diagonal, it will be dominated by the largest positive eigenvalue. Let's look at, at this. So now I'm taking a, a mutation rate of 1% and uh, the same M matrix as we had before. And look, let's look at the growth. So now with mutation, you see that type 1 increases exponentially, just like it did before. Type 2 at first decreases, just like it did also like it did before. But then it starts increasing. This is a bit weird. Let's continue the graph a bit further. So instead of doing just 50 steps, let's do 150 steps. What you can see is type 2 decreases first, but then starts to also increase exponentially at the same rate as type 1. Let's look at the eigenvector that corresponds to this growth. So you see that the matrix W times M has two eigenvectors and with two corresponding eigenvalues. Why an eigenvector is 0, 1, and the other one is an eigenvector where both type 1 and type 2 are present, which has a growth rate of 1.089. So it has a growth rate of hi higher than 1, whereas the other one has a growth rate of lower than 1. Therefore, this is the dominant eigenve eigenvector. And this distribution, where both type 1 and type 2 are present, is called the quasi-species. So we see that instead of just having one type in a population with very few mutants, both types are present and grow exponentially. Let's change the mutation rate. Instead of having a mutation rate of 1%, let's change it to 8%. Now you see both types grow exponentially, but type 2, the green type, is now present at a higher frequency that, than type 1. So the quasi-species is now mainly composed of type 2 with very few type 1. Let's see what it looks like in the eigenvalue. Again, you see there's two eigenvectors with two corresponding eigenvalues. The largest eigenvalue is this, 1.01. And it has both type 1 and type 2, where type 2 is present at a higher frequency. If we increase the mutation rate even further, let's go to 0 0.2. Now you see uh, that both types don't increase, they decrease. Type 1 decreases exponentially fa at a faster rate. And type 2 decreases exponentially, probably with a rate of 0 0.95. If we now look at the eigen, uh, eigenvalues, you see again there's two eigenvalues and two eigenvectors. The larger eigenvalue this time is the 0 0.95. Its corresponding eigenvector is this one that has only type 2 present and not type 1. The other eigen, eigenvector has a negative uh, component of type 2, so it, it can't actually exist. This crossing where type 1 is lost and type 2 is the only one that is present in the population at a higher enough uh, error rate is what we call the error catastrophe. Let's look at this a bit further. So now I will want to plot, instead of going manually through different values of, of uh, S, let's just uh, go through a a large sequence of S and plot what happens with them. So here's what, what we get. On, on the x-axis, actually, I, I modified mu. So the x-axis represents mu, the mutation rate. And the y-axis is, is the largest eigenvalue. So this is the growth rate of the quasi-species of the types that grows with the highest, the, the various rates. 
So you see when S is very low, we have a growth rate very close to 1.1, and the type that has both type 1 and type 2 uh, increases exponentially. This eigenvector, as mu uh, increases, goes lower and lower until at this point it actually crosses and becomes lower than the other eigenvalue, the eigenvalue with a growth rate of 0 0.95. At this point, type 1 will disappear from the population and only type 2 will be present. So this transition is what we call the error catastrophe. The mutation rate is too high. Um, in, the, in the mutation matrix that I had before, I only let type 1 mutate. So type 1 mutated into type 2, but type 2 did not mutate back to type 1. This is where the error catastrophe is strongest. If we allow back mutation, so here I'm now working with a matrix where type 2 can mutate to type 1 with a low rate of mu divided by 100. Let's see what happens then. I plot, whoops, I plot exactly the same, I plot exactly the same as I did before. And now you see that the two eigen eigenvalues don't cross. This eigenvalue decreases and then becomes almost 0 0.95. And this eigenvalue uh, stays at 0 0.95 and then decreases almost linearly, but they never cross. The reason is that type 1 is still present in the population. It's simply, it's generated by mutations from type 2. So the cross, there is not a full crossing and therefore it's not a real phase transition. Let's uh, derive the, this error catastrophe when it happens. So we have now M without a back mutation, 1 minus mu mu, and W with a growth rate of uh, W for, the, for type 1. We multiply the two matrices, and this, this is the result of the multiplication. So we simply take 1 minus 2 mu times W, mu times 0, and so on. This is the result. Now, in order to calculate an eigenvector, we simply multiply this by a vector, one alpha, and we want to calculate when multiplying this vector times this matrix will give us a vector that has exactly the same ratios. This will be an eigenvector of this of the matrix W times M. In order to for it to stay at the same ratio, the ratio between this and this has to be like the ratio between one and alpha. Therefore, mu plus alpha divided by one minus mu times W has to be equal to alpha we can simply do a, few, a bit of algebra and then we get that alpha has to be equal to mu divided by w times 1 minus mu minus 1. So in order for alpha to be positive, in order for there to be an eigenvalue where both types can be represented or both type 1 and type 2 are present, this needs to be positive. For this to be positive, the denominator needs to be positive. Uh, which means that W times 1 minus mu has to be bigger than 1. Another way to write it is ri to write W as 1 plus S, where S is the, uh, uh, the growth rate beyond 1. Uh, and then we need to have 1 plus S times 1 minus mu is bigger than 1, which means that for small s and small mu, S has to be approximately bigger than mu. So the error threshold happens when the growth rate is bigger than the mutation rate, or when the mutation rate is uh, low enough. Let's switch now to a representation of the error catastrophe as it was originally introduced by Manfred Eigen and Peter Schuster, where they looked at, instead of just looking at two types, they looked at the genome of lengths L, which means that they had four to the L types. And they assume for simplicity that there is one optimal sequence, A, A, G, C, and so on. And but I would like to be able to talk about a, just a binary sequence instead of four bases. So let's look at the binary genome, which one means that the sequence is identical to the optimum, and zero means that it's different from the optimum. Let's look at the per site mutation rate instead of a global rate. So nu is now the mutation rate per site. And just for simplicity, I assume it's the same uh, to go from optimum to non-optimum and back. So now we look just at ones and zeros. And, just, and we assume that there's just one mutation per time step. So mu is low enough in L versus L so that there's only one, time, one mutation per time step. We'll call I the number of zeros, and we'll simply look at the types as the number of zeros that are, we have in the sequence. So 
i represents the number of zeros, l minus i, the number of ones. Now we can calculate the probability to go from i zeros to i plus one. In order for that to happen, a mutation needs to happen, so it's l times nu. And then the mutation needs to hit a one and mutate into it into a zero. So it's l minus i times l times l nu, which gives us simply l minus i times nu. And similar for decreasing uh, one, the number of zeros. Let's see what it does. So we have a nu of 1% uh, and a length of l, l equal 10. And now we need to build the mutation matrix. We assume that we can only mutate one up or one down. And I simply take the expression that we just calculated. This gives us the following matrix. You can see that the matrix is different from zero only along the diagonal and one step away because we only allow one mutation. Now we can also build the uh, growth rate matrix, it's diagonal, and only has one entry that's different from one. So I take a growth rate of 1.3, which is for type one. Now we can look at the maximal eigenvalue, the eigenvector with the maximal eigenvalue for this matrix W times M. And we see that type one is represented uh, at, at the highest frequency and other types are also represented. So this, this would be the quasi-species in this case. The population would be represented by the optimal type, types with one mutation, two mutations, and so on. What happens now when we increase the mutation rate? Uh, sorry, when we decrease the uh, selection pressure. Let's go now to a, a, a benefit of 0 0.08, so a growth rate of 1.08. You can see that now the optimal type is represented with, a, with a, a quite a low frequency and all the other types are represented quite highly. In order to get a better overview of what happens, let's look at uh, various S's. So we have plotted four different S's. S equals 0 0.3, like we had before. You see that type one is, uh, has the highest representation. One mutation away, a bit lower, and so on. S equal to two, it spreads out a bit more. S equal to 0 0.1, it's very far spread. At 0 0.9, you see the type one is already at a fairly low frequency, and the highest type is the type that you would get mostly if you did uh, just a random coin flip with a uh, five ones and five zeros. And then as S goes to 0 0.07, you see that uh, type one is almost totally non-present and only this type is, is represented. We can also represent it as a graph. In a graph here on the x-axis is S, S goes from zero to 0 0.8, and the y-axis is the frequency of the various types. Black represents the optimal type. Uh, this is the type with one mutation, two mutations, three mutations, and so on. You see that the when the benefit is 0 0.8, so growth rate is 1.8, type one is represented at the higher, highest frequency. As S goes down, the representation of type one decreases and of the other types increases until we reach this threshold where type one almost disappears from the population. And the highest, the highest representative type is the type that has five mutations. This is simply, at this point, it's simply, we simply look at coin flips. So the, the selection, pre selection doesn't affect the population anymore. Let's calculate where this transition happens. So we said that the uh, chance to go from i to i plus one is l minus i times nu. Now we want to ask, can we maintain the zero type? So when i equal to zero, we want to maintain zero type versus going from zero to one. Therefore, we look at just the transition rate from zero to one. That rate is L times nu. Any mutation will uh, increase the number of uh, one, a uh, number of zeros. Um, so what is now the error catastrophe? The global mutation rate, not per site, but for the whole genome now, to go from zero to one is L times nu. And now we will th therefore have the same error threshold as before. S needs to be bigger than mu, which is L times nu. So the error threshold will happen when S is bigger than L times the per site mutation rate. This is a very nice expression. Uh, Eigen and Schuster used it to calculate uh, an error threshold for how 
a good Kenner molecule replicate. So if a molecule has a replication of, with a fidelity of 1%, it cannot code for this fidelity of 1% with a molecule that's larger than, than 100 bases. If it has one per mil, it can't code it for la with a molecule larger than 1,000 bases. So uh, this shows that in order to, you need to cross a threshold of fidelity with a short enough molecule. This, this expression can also represent what it means to be neutral versus non-neutral. How big does the difference have to be between one type and another for, the, for evolution to be able to maintain this difference? In order to look at this, let's look at a, a population that has not just a difference between the best type and all the others, but instead there's a, 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 stair, a stairs between every, one type and the next. So the highest type has zero mutations, then the next highest uh, growth rate is one mutation, two mutations, and so on, with some kind of some chosen uh, uh, randomly chosen growth rates. The difference, this threshold between type 0 and type 1, or between type 1 and type 2, I've called delta S, the change in growth rate. And now we need to be able to maintain this difference versus the mutation. If we look at the, at the change in growth rate from I to I plus 1, if that is delta S I, we want to ask when can this be maintained versus the mutation? And what, what needs to happen is that del delta S i needs to be bigger than L minus i, the chance to go from i to i minus 1, uh, to I, from i to i plus 1, times mu. Uh, so we can take a random example. Here I simply choose random S's with random uh, uh, steps. So the x-axis in black represents the delta Si, the step from uh, the change in growth rate from uh, i to i plus 1. And the red line represents L minus i times nu. This is the effect of the mutations. In order to be able to maintain a certain number of mutations, the black line has to be above the red line. So this means that this population can maintain this point versus, versus uh, the effect of mutation, whereas it cannot maintain these points. So the difference between this and this, as far as this population is concerned, is neutral. This point can be, uh, uh, can, be uh, uh, can be maintained, but this point again cannot be maintained. So we can see that the mutation rate defines what is seen as neutral versus non-neutral, and the distribution in the population has to be above a, an error threshold, we can, which can be crossed, as you see here, several times. Thank you.